right, I'm Joseph Newman, uh, and we're going to uh, have some young people here with us from North Texas University. This is Aaron. Diane's going to be hip assisting him. Uh, she's going to be a teacher, and Aaron's going to get the idea of the power it takes to even move the shaft of this seven and a half thousand pound motor. And Aaron's going to pick it straight up with one hand, straight over the shaft. Put your hand straight over it. You're going to just do a curl. Go through. And you can see how hard that is, and that's good. All right, and what I want is your honest opinion. What do you think the chances are the current out of this battery is gonna run that motor? I'd probably say impossible by itself. Okay, okay, <laughs> all right, good. And that's what I want people to understand. It is impossible by conventional wisdom that this can happen. Now this is from Energizer that you can pull up on the internet. <clears throat> they tell you a toy is a high drain device. See it in black here? Mm -hmm. Now what they're really telling you is don't put this toy, in, and here's a toy motor. That's a toy motor, this is a toy they're talking about. Feel the weight of that, there's nothing to it. <clears throat> now here's the smoke detector. It shows you a nine volt battery. <clears throat> And this is what the manufacturer of this battery is saying, this is what we recommend that you use, a garage opener, a clock radio, or a smoke detector. <clears throat> they say even a baby monitor is a pretty, pretty high drain device, and, and that little toy motor that you're holding is a high drain device. Now you won't see a nine volt battery do anything of any work. So how are we gonna even move this seven and a half thousand motor, pound motor, hooked to that 375 pound mud pump because we'll take a nine volt battery that I've got right here that's brand new. Now what I want to do is just verify <clears throat> this is a brand new battery. And it's going to show 9.5 volts. Y'all see it? 9.5 volts. A brand new battery. All right, now let's take it and hook it to a little DC motor. Now this has got a pump on it, uh, but all it is is just a little tiny propeller in here, which is nothing compared to this big 375 pound mud pump you see back here. All right, now watch the meter, because I'm going to touch this and it just will move this, this little pump, just real wide, real slow. Now watch how that bolt falls. You see it? It's dead. The battery is dead. What you reading? It's like one point. Three, one point four. It keeps moving around. <laughs> yep. All right. But see, you killed the battery. And, and not only that, this battery's getting warm right now. Mm -hmm. One of these little batteries, and it's going to run that 7,500 pound machine. Let me just hold it up here against it and get an idea of how tiny it is. Now, I'm going to show you all something that proves this to the lay people. This is a blow up from the Granger catalog. Now look at something. I've got it marked in yellow. Watch a one horsepower. This is the amps, 4.4 amps. You saw that little white DC motor kill that the instant I even touched it to it. Now this motor here draws 4.4 amps and 230 volts to 460 volts. All right, now let's go down to a 10 horsepower. A 10, 10 horsepower draws 25.2 amps. Notice some, it weighs 360 pounds. This one horsepower motor weighed 89 pounds. So the mass gets bigger and bigger for the horsepower. Let's go to 50 horsepower. Now it's 57 amps and it weighs 636 pounds. Now it's 100 horsepower. 121 amps, and this is 1,660 pounds. You can see as the motor gets bigger, it draws more amps, <clears throat> which is more power, because the voltage is basically the same, 230 to 460. When it gets down here to these big motors, they're all 460. 225 amps on a 200 horsepower, and the motor weighs 2,200 pounds. Can you see, it's totally telling you 
that the conventional motors that they say is highly efficient, best motors in the world, they run off a of current. This motor weighs 2,200 pounds. Now, if that other motor weighs 2,200 pounds, that's three times the weight of that conventional motor in the Granger catalog. If that's drawing 225 amps, this ought to be at least three times that, 600 and some odd amps is what it should be drawing. This will change your earth. And it's just like all the way back from Socrates to Max Planck. And advancement of new technology is not done by the old, they die away. It's you, the young, who grow up familiar with it, that bring it forward. That's why it's up to you. Now with that, we'll start running the motor. What we're gonna do now is, uh, we're gonna hook it up to nine volt transistor batteries. And this is gonna be a knockout punch. Pow! Is what it's gonna be. It's a knockout punch, just pow! He's got 120 now. All right, now look at that water. That boat is the 470 boats, 460 boats. 60 to 70 boats. That thing's staying negative most the whole time. Now, and that's that fire going back in there that all those sides are saw. Now that's why these batteries are not running this motor. It's not pumping that water like you see there. That's how many gallons you're pumping per hour. Then you multiply that time 24. It tells you how many gallons and you're doing it on nine volt transistor batteries in series. The current's equivalent to what's in one battery. This is totally impossible by conventional technology. This meter is running negative. It will change the world. Let me read a quote to you. John Kennedy, this is his quote in 1961. <clears throat> if we could ever, completely at a cheap rate, get fresh water from salt water, this would be in the long range interest of humanity, which could really dwarf any other scientific accomplishment. John F. Kennedy, September the 22nd, 1961. You can give fresh water to the world. Three fourths of the earth is covered with salt water. It costs too much by conventional wisdom. Now I want y'all to keep something in mind. These batteries are in series. The current is still. Just running that machine is from this only. Now it's up to you, the young people, to spread this across the world and put it on the internet and have all your friends. Tell them, pull up this site. And if you care about your own well-being, the power brokers have fought this man all of his life. And I'm 73 and I'm still a tiger. And I'm fighting for y'all. But y'all gotta fight for yourself because the power brokers don't want you to have this. They want to keep charging you for gasoline. If this batteries will run this seven and a half thousand pound machine, you know it'll run a car. It'll run industry, it'll run the world, it'll run ships, it'll run planes, it'll run anything. This motor is unbiased, totally unbiased. It'll change y'all's world. That's why you have a source now, the internet, you can beat the power brokers of the world with this. Now this thing will run long, way past the time you've got to stay here and see it. What questions do y'all want to ask me for the young people? This is Al Swimmer, came all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. He's a good friend of mine because he understands the magnitude of this technology. This is Diane, she's a student at North Texas University. She's gonna be a teacher and she wants to ask some questions. <clears throat> what questions do you like right, to ask? So <coughs> my main question is, you have this huge machine, but how are you gonna make it to where it can be in a household? Like, how much is it gonna cost? Is it gonna be the small machine? And what are you gonna do with it? Okay, now, now Diane's asking the question, how big is this machine going to be that runs a house? <clears throat> it may be about one and a half times as big as this machine right here. <clears throat> There's something else we will do. 
We will take this same technology and make motors that go in every washer, every air conditioner, every device that goes in your refrigerator, every device that goes in your house and reduce your power bill. That's what this thing will do. But getting that cost down, cheaper, 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 cheaper. Pretty much all the way. All the way to nothing. And this, it costs, you said it costs about 10,000 to put it in a home. <coughs> Uh, yeah, but I want to get it down even cheaper than that. Not I this. mean, if you think about it, that's how much you pay in like three years with electric bills. Exactly, so it pays off itself, and it's. Really you might tell them how long it'll last. Oh, yeah. Nothing, long nothing long wears out. Long. You only think the wear out of that is two bearings in that system. <clears throat> now we got brushes on that that will wear out eventually, <clears throat> but with diodes you can do away with the brushes that you don't even need them but they'll last for a good 20 or 30 years. You know, and, so, and they don't cost anything to replace them. <clears throat> but the major part of this motor will last long past your lifetime. Lasting for that long, you know, you, what you're putting into it, it's gonna make sense. <laughs> now, I'm gonna show y'all something else. There's a law called Kershaw's Law. It says, the second law says that if <clears throat> You have loads in a system. You'll have a voltage drop across each one of them. But if you add up all the voltage drops across the system, it will equal the input voltage. <clears throat> in fact, when they write out the equation, it says this. The difference between the input voltage and the voltage drops across the system is zero. Meaning, it won't be a difference. You can't get a difference. They also, that second law is to verify the conservation of energy. Well, I'm gonna show you a violation of it right now. <clears throat> now, what I have is a capacitor in line, parallel with this motor, parallel with it. Now, y'all come here. Diane, you hold this for them. Let's see, I gotta go just a little bit closer. All right, watch it. Well, oh, man, I know it's going to show overloaded. Let me use this meter. What exactly is this showing? This is... It's going to show you voltage. Mm -hmm. All right. It's like when it's negative, it's... Yeah, but watch. Yeah. That shows overload. <laughs> yeah. Call it out. It's overload because up to 9.0 and then 10 and then overload. All right, now overload yeah. is 1,000 volts. Yeah. Overload is a thousand volts. Yeah. All right, now I'm going to use this other meter. Now it goes up to 80,000 volts. Okay. All right, now you just hold that again. Okay. This holds up to how much? Now see, this will show you 0.1, but you got to multiply it yeah. times a thousand. <laughs> Whatever you read, you got to multiply it times a thousand. So he's reading the voltage from the capacitor now. All right, call out what you see. Time a thousand. Time a thousand. Going up to ten, eight thousand, seven thousand, ten thousand. <laughs> that's like ten thousand. Right. See, that's point seven, which is seven hundred, uh, nine hundred. When he says point, and I see, see that's that one. A yeah, one is over a thousand. Okay, there's nine hundred, a thousand, and yeah, nine hundred. All right. Now this voltage is greater because <coughs> we'll, let's go over here with the same meter and measure <coughs> this voltage on this battery pack. <coughs> now you won't see that. Well, let's see. All right, now what you got? All right, see, that's almost double of what this is. 500 to 400, and you had 900 to 1,000 over there. Now, that shows a violation of Kershaw's second law. And now, <clears throat> you know that that's true. That's true. <clears throat> now, any scientist knows this, but my point is you're seeing something that is impossible. Al comes here all the way from Phoenix because he knows it's for real. Well, Al, what can we say to <clears throat> make young people understand they got to get behind this? I think first we ought to say that most people don't use their God-given powers 
of thinking for themselves. And that this is one time when they really should. I mean, instead of listening to somebody else, just think about what Joseph told you about the size of the battery of the amps that are in the battery that are running this machine. Because it is something really different. You don't really have anything to base it on to compare it with, with the old motors, because they're running on amperage. This one's running on voltage. It's a completely different story. So you don't, you shouldn't go to any authorities to find out about it because the authorities aren't authorities on this. The authority is right here. You saw that young man try to turn that shaft and he was straining just to try to move it with one hand from a dead stop. Now that one little battery runs this pump like it ain't spit. That's the magnitude of what you're looking at. Now the, the motor itself is unbiased. It don't care what you hook it to. If you give it enough voltage, it'll run anything that you want to put to it. I think you might also point out how almost effortless the pump is working. Sometimes you see a pump working and it's really working hard because of it, but it's so smooth. This really proves it good if you ask me. I think this is better than the front. <laughs> you can tell what's going on here. It'll change the world if we can get it out there. That's all we have to do, get it out there. Now, we put an amp meter in the line to see what that current is. Now, this is changing constantly. And most of the time, it's an extremely low power. I have fixed this so that it'll show you point zero 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 right now. Now this goes from point zero to point four. The current is extremely low. This thing shows you it's running off a of voltage. It's not running off a of current. Dead batteries have voltage capacity, but they have no current capacity. I can run that machine off of dead nine volt batteries. It takes no power to produce voltage. Al, tell them what would happen if we turned this up to 10,000 revolutions a minute. The power this thing would have. It would run a whole city without any problem as far as, as, far as the power requirements go. That's the magnitude of this because we're converting mass into energy on a 100% conversion process. The current from that battery is not running that machine. This meter is telling you it's not running the machine. It shows you in spades everything that the scientists have screamed at y'all. This is ready for mass production. The origin of Joe's discovery dates back to 1957, when he was stationed in Puerto Rico on an army base. I just saw a lot of disparity between wealth and poverty. And I was in an orphanage home myself when I was a kid, and I feel compassion for people. I saw 200 people get wiped out on Indian Island in a hurricane. They had it on the news one day like it was 200 pigs. And that really upset me. And so I stood on a mountain one night talking to God and looking up into a beautiful night of stars, billions of stars. And I made a vow that this, I'm the only entity in the universe. I'm going to make an effort to do good, do good for humanity. And I prefer death than not do it. Give me the wisdom. Give me the knowledge that I can accomplish what I wish to accomplish before I die. I'll never see this disparity of wealth and poverty anywhere on earth or the injustice that I see here. I have lived that vow. But Joe was a young inventor, not a scientist. He patented some of the first plastic-covered barbells in America. Then one day he came across a book on electrical energy that gave him new insights into how the universe worked. In 1968, God had me go through a series of thoughts, and I saw it. It's a gyroscopic particle, and I knew that it was right, and I knew it could be beneficial to mankind. Gyroscopes, like this child's toy, stabilize as they spin on their axis. In examining the way magnets attract and repel, Joe came up with nothing less than a working model for the universe that turned scientific theory of the last 200 years on its ear. He believes all atomic particles are actually tiny gyroscopes, Always staying level, they move in endless spirals, attracting and colliding with each other. And it's that theory that drives his machine. I think it's probably the most significant discovery in the history of man. 
Still, the U.S. Patent Office calls Newman's invention an impossible perpetual motion machine, and for eight years now has refused to grant him a patent. If I'm wrong, the best way to have exposed me, issue the patent, throw me out in the public, and if I was wrong, they'd prove us wrong right quick. Nobody be embarrassed but Joe Newman. Today, Joe Newman was not embarrassed. He brought his slow-moving car to a stop after two hours and said it could have gone on and on. Newman compared it to the first flight of the Wright brothers. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Biloxi, Mississippi. And for your can-do CBS Evening News, Dan Rather. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Seldom has any story we've covered sparked more reaction than the strange saga of Joseph Newman. Mr. Newman is a Mississippi inventor who makes some strange claims concerning an energy machine he invented. The public and scientific communities have been amused, angered, and at the same time very interested. Garland Robinette has followed this story for more than a year now. The latest twist took him to our nation's capital. The controversy began as soon as Joseph Newman introduced this strange-looking device to an energy-hungry public. He claimed that this electromagnetic machine operates without the use of any conventional fuels. He claimed the machine produces more energy out than is externally put in. Now pick an expert in the field and they'll tell you that's impossible. But Mr. Newman claims he is achieving this by an internal conversion of matter into energy. And now 31 people with scientific backgrounds have signed legal documents swearing to the machine's validity. But the most important endorsement came this week from a most unlikely source. Mr. Newman has been fighting for a patent for years. Many, therefore, considered it ironic when a federal judge appointed the former head of the patent office, William Schuyler, to decide if Newman's device did or did not work. Mr. Schuyler, who is also considered to be an expert on electrical engineering, didn't take long to make his decision. In a report of the special master, Mr. Schuyler states, Evidence before the court is overwhelming that Newman has built and tested a prototype of his invention in which the output energy exceeds the external input energy. Therefore, there is no contradictory factual evidence. For the layman, that means the machine works. The expert then goes on to say, the patent office finding that such a machine is impossible is clearly erroneous. Mr. Schuyler also found that the patent office intentionally did not consider the formalities of Mr. Newman's application for a patent. Why wouldn't you go along, again, with a master that's former head of the, the uh, patent office, who has credentials that the uh, judge called outstanding, why wouldn't you go along with the man that you recommended in granting a patent? You ask mean questions, don't you? I think you'd have to address that question to our present commissioner. Are you acting on his orders? You might say that, yes. In this case, there's only one word for it so far, and that's outrageous. Long ago, the patent office should have issued a patent. But since then, a number of incidents have occurred that makes it entirely possible that Mr. Newman has discovered a new form of energy that could have a tremendous impact on all of our lives. The first of those incidents occurred in March of this year when engineers from Mississippi State University arrived in Loosedale, Mississippi to test Mr. Newman's device. Representatives of the State Department of Energy were also on hand to observe the testing. For six days, tests were run. Some of the tests were simple, some of the results perplexing. WWL engineers conducted one of the tests done by Mississippi State. Eight slightly used pin -like batteries in series were placed on a motor that was doing virtually no work. That's it. The batteries died in one minute and 15 seconds. Those dead, dry cell batteries that are not supposed to recharge were then linked to a portable model of Mr. Newman's invention. The batteries turned a 90-pound magnet for one hour and 15 minutes. Then, because of a lack of time on our part, we removed the batteries. We then reattached the batteries to the original motor. The motor ran two minutes and 28 seconds before the batteries died. That is twice as long as the first time on batteries that are not supposed to recharge. Almost any engineer or physicist will tell you that those test results should be impossible. But after six days of test, the senior engineer doing the testing for Mississippi State said Mr. Newman's machine did produce more energy out than in. That too is supposed to be impossible. 
On August 18th of this year, Joseph Newman was invited to the NASA facility near Picayune, Mississippi. Over 70 scientists and engineers wanted to hear Mr. Newman's theory. At the time, WWL was slated to tape that meeting. But the night before the meeting, we were called and asked not to come. It seems the scientists and engineers felt they would be restricted in their questioning of Mr. Newman if television cameras were present. So, we agreed to stay away. For Joseph Newman, the meeting was very important. It was the first time that he had stood before so many experts in the fields of physics and engineering. Experts who had the capability of disproving his strange theory. But at the end of the two-hour meeting, just the opposite occurred. I asked him uh, two very distinct questions uh, toward the conclusion. I said, does anyone here disagree with what I'm saying? No one spoke up. No one disagreed. Complete and total silence. I said, uh, well, let me ask it another way. Is there anyone here who agrees with what I'm saying? And uh, surprising to me, vigorously, quite a few people spoke up and said, yeah. So once again, Joseph Newman and his theory have been put to the test. And once again, no one disproves it. Many agree with it. But no attempt is made to conduct definitive tests. That's not negative at all. In August of this year, Joseph Newman called one of the premier instrumentation firms in the world. He requested that engineers be sent to his home to make sure the testing equipment he had purchased from that company was working properly. On August 24th, two engineers tested the equipment and Mr. Newman's machine. Both were electrical engineers with 50 years experience between them. One had a master's degree from MIT. After testing the Newman device for five hours, one of the engineers called me. He said the machine is simply incredible. It does exactly as the inventor claims. He then offered a letter and the test results. Plus, he and his partner agreed to an interview. But the next day, company representatives called WWL to say there would be no letter, no interviews, and the company's name should not be used. Shortly thereafter, the two engineers asked us not to use their name for fear of being fired. At that point, WWL engineers agreed to duplicate the test that the two engineers had done. After a day and a half of testing, the results showed a device 820% efficient. Now to that, engineers and physicists will immediately say impossible, when in fact that figure is misleading, because this very unconventional device, powered by heretofore unknown process, is being measured by conventional instruments and equations. But nevertheless, the proof remains. According to conventional theory, it can't do what it's doing. Just sitting there continuously rotating the rotor requires more power than is going into the device. There's three, three forms of power that can come out of this device. Mechanical power, uh, electrical power, and then the power that's fed back into the batteries. So there's three separate outputs of power. And actually, we're only measuring one of these. So the actual power output of it is, is greater than what we've measured. Before testing the machine and meeting the inventor, one WWL engineer said, in effect, the whole thing was preposterous. The other said, oh no, not another perpetual motion device. But when the tests were over, no one said preposterous, no one thought perpetual motion. I'm absolutely fascinated. Uh, I have, of course, a certain amount of ambivalence, as, as most people do, who have been grounded in conventional theory, in that it looks too good to be true, yet on the other hand, his theory makes a great deal of sense. It explains things uh, in magnetic theory that were never satisfactorily explained to me by conventional theory. And if, in fact, his device does work, which I believe it does, uh, I firmly believe we s stand on the threshold of something absolutely unknown in the history of humanity. During this week, we've presented scientists and engineers who have tested the machine and not only agree that the unit works, but that someday it will also power cars, planes, and ships. In short, they believe the invention of Joseph Newman could possibly change the world. When Einstein first claimed that E equals MC square, even his closest friends in the scientific community said, impossible. When Robert Goddard, the father of modern day rockets, first suggested a rocket flight to the moon, his fellow engineers and the media totally ignored him. And just this week, there was 81-year-old Barbara McClintock. She was labeled absolutely mad when she said her experiments with corn in her backyard proved that genes could travel. On well, Monday, 43 years after the fact, she was given a Nobel Prize for her work. This prototype is simply to prove the merit of this theory. What the theory shows is that very quickly, 
a very compact small device can be made uh, and be produced for the consumer probably in a couple of year, years of a uh, time that they could buy for a home, an automobile, or an airplane, or a space vehicle, or whatever. And once they buy that device, they'll never have to pay for energy again. If you doubt this strange story, you are not alone. One of the first to doubt was Dr. Roger Hastings, a PhD in physics from Minnesota. After conducting innumerable tests, Dr. Hastings no longer doubts. Are you not talking about a machine that would change the world? It certainly would. Do you know how crazy that's going to sound to the people watching? Well, just about as crazy as it sounded to me the first time I heard it. <laughs> but uh, my point of view uh, is just that I have made measurements, I've seen enough experiments that are just not explainable on the basis of our present understanding of, my present understanding of, of uh, physics. It's something that, that would really change the world, and it's something that any conscientious person can't walk away from. When you've seen something that puts out more energy than it takes in, and you've taken some measurements that tell you that's true, if you have any conscience at all, you can't walk away from that. When Joseph Newman stepped before a news conference today to make his astonishing claims, sitting beside him was Dr. Hastings and representatives of the State Department of Energy, longtime skeptics. Now convinced. I was not convinced probably on the first three times that I saw the device and saw it tested that uh, that indeed it put out more energy than it than it took in. I am convinced now. Uh, I was a little bit prejudiced and like all people that come up with uh, devices like this you think they're wrong and so you go down to prove them wrong if you're that interested and I was not able to prove him wrong nor were the people that I was with able to prove him wrong. But for those of us who worry about skyrocketing utility bills and Arab oil embargoes, just imagine, what if Joe Newman is right? I think Einstein's going to have to take a second seat to Joe Newman. But acceptance has been a long time in coming. Joseph Newman's obsession began in 1967, when he began sending his 130-page thesis to every major government department in the United States. Response was either non-existent or negative for years. But in the late 1970s, that began to change. In 1976, Senator John Stennis requested funding for the project. Later, astronaut Captain Ronald Evans approved the theory and recommended it to NASA. Shortly thereafter, in 1979, Dr. Robert Smith, Chief of Space Environments at NASA, wrote, Because of your theory, several laws of physics may need to be re-examined. And then, Dr. E. L. Moraine, one of the men involved in the making of the atomic bomb, wrote, your project will lead to developments that would be beneficial to all mankind. So in little less than a year, the U.S. Patent Office has told the man who just may have an amazing machine, number one, they didn't want to talk with him. Number two, they will never give him a patent. Number three, the invention has a hidden energy device. Number four, there is no hidden energy device. Your invention works, but your description of the invention is inadequate. And finally, your description is adequate. Your invention does not work. We are back. Would you welcome, please, Joseph Newman. Nice to meet you. I appreciate you having me. Do you think your machine, if it can be commercially made available, can, for example, a person would buy a three or four hundred pound unit and all of a sudden would be able to produce all of the energy they need for their home? Is that certainly within the realm of possibility? Exactly. I have absolutely no doubt about it. That uh, such a device hooked to a home, a person will never have to pay for energy again. The device will be made uh, smaller as to put in an automobile plane, spacecraft, you name it, this device. Using the atoms from the, from the magnetic field. And what you're doing is that you're converting mass into energy on a 100% conversion process. That's one of the first prototypes, and it, uh, that's a 700-pound magnetic rotor, and it's got uh, about 8,000 pounds of wire around it. Now, it's gone down. That unit there weighs 135 pounds, and I showed that at the Hilton in uh, New Orleans. There was approximately uh, 2,500 people attended, 1,000 people outside, and another 1,200, 1,500 standing to get in. 
and uh, it would demonstrate something like 25 times more out than externally inputted into the system. You get more wattage out of that than than what you'd, what you'd, put, mm -hmm. what you'd put in. In fact, uh, Rayback Battery Company is working with me now trying to design a battery to hold up to this recharging effect of this system. Because not only will it run the device, it'll put more energy back into the battery pack and came out of it. So you could... That's, that, that's fascinating. Uh, I'll tell you what, it's, we could stay here all night. I am Joseph Newman. Jim is doing this. He's not used the camera before, but uh, you know what? he's going to do the best he can. All right, now this is from the Granger catalog, but it clearly shows you as the motor gets bigger constantly, it gets more weight, more weight. This one here is 360 pounds. This one here is 1,660 pounds. That's 2,200 pounds. Well, notice something. As you do this, the amps, just like that, gets bigger. As the motor gets bigger, the current draw gets bigger, 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 bigger. Down here is 121. Here is 225 amps of current. And the heat laws on the motor is the current squared times the resistance. This motor weighs 2,200 pounds. It claims to be 96% efficient. 96% efficient. The heat loss in, the mo in a motor is the current squared. You square 225 times the heat resistance, uh, times the resistance in a motor, it tells you the heat loss in the motor, which is phenomenal. They're not highly efficient. Uh, we're going to show if this motor is efficient, because this motor weighs seven and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> now this is what the numbers show you. If you double the speed of Big Eureka, it's 40 horsepower. If you triple the speed of Eureka, it's 90 horsepower. Four times the speed of Eureka, it's 160 horsepower. Five times the speed of Eureka, it's 250 horsepower. Six times the speed of Eureka, it's 360 horsepower. And it will only be turning at 780 revolutions a minute. Now I'm going to turn it up to over 200 revolutions a minute right now and run it for you off the current out of these batteries right here, which is totally impossible. Now watch this machine do what I tell you it's going to do. I'm going to hook it up. It's running off the current of this, and the current is equivalent to what's in one little old tiny battery. Okay, now watch that machine get faster and faster as I simply step this voltage up. As the voltage goes up, that machine gets faster and faster and faster. And there's no limit to this. I can make this motor run at speed of any speed I wish to. Just by stepping this voltage up. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take a gasoline engine at 20 horsepower. And I'm going to hook it to this motor. And we're going to hook it on to, to a big boat. And push it takes hundreds to a thousand horsepower to move it. And I'll run it off this very motor. With 20 horsepower. And you can hear it gaining speed, get faster and faster. Is that showing? 680, 670. Alright, that's the voltage. That's going 
at a high rate of speed. I'll go back here and check your RPM. Just stay up there and come on the front right back. Already, 211. See that? 211 revolutions a minute. Now you look at that water. That's constantly coming out of that mud pump. You've never seen a mud pump run that constant in your life. That water is constant coming out of it. And I'll raise this up so you can see it. I'm going to go back and check it again. It's probably goes going up. This is the fastest I've ever seen. Big group to run. It's running so smoothly. Oh, nine volt batteries that are in series. 211, yes. All right. The manufacturer tells you a toy is a high drain device. This toy is a high drain device on these batteries. You tell them you run a 7,500 pound electrical motor with a 375 pound muck pump, they say you're crazy. What's the matter with you people? This machine can turn on up and push the ship. Dr. Swimmer is on that video telling you, you turn this up to 10,000 revolutions a minute and it'll run a city. Now he's a mathematician, he understands the magnitude. He tells you there's one expert on this, and that's me. Y'all should pay attention to what he's telling you. This machine is just screaming to y'all. I'm gonna shut it down because I've, we've got these other videos up there and we just wanna add this to it. Now, it's a waste of time if you don't pay attention to it. Now, you can keep paying for the oil and pay through the nose and uh, chips and things are not even running now because of the cost of oil. You can keep doing that, or you can get behind the technology that God's given to the world, and y'all ain't done nothing. Well, that, we're going to shut it down. Is there anything you want to say, Jim? Oh, Joseph, just, uh, I'm sad at heart that powerful people that could bring this forward have decided to suppress it instead of helping it. Okay, well, the machine speaks for itself, and that water's running continuously. Let them see it one more time. They ain't never seen a mud pump run like that in their life. Now watch something. We go ahead and get this to 336, and I'm going to disconnect it. Look at this. It's 335. When it gets to 336, I'm going to disconnect it. It'll take three minutes for it to stop. Three minutes, they'll keep running. It does that the whole time it's running. 336, there it is. It's disconnected. I take that wire loose. There ain't no wire hooked with it. Look at it. Keep running. Keep pumping this water. Any other motor that had this kind of a load on it, you break the circuit, it would stop the instant you cut the power from it. Still going. We want to stop, we want to stem it until it stops. This is what the machine is doing the whole time those batteries are hooked to it. Those batteries are not running this machine. The manufacturer tells you it's impossible to move a seven and a half thousand pound motor. The Granger catalog tells anybody who's got a brain it's impossible to move this seven and a half thousand pound motor. This motor will change the world. Already we over one minute. 337. This is something God has given to the world. I want you to keep checking on the clock. It's going to turn to 338 in a second. There it is. What do we start at? 236. Okay. That's two minutes. It'll still run for another minute. Still pumping water. 
You got a pump in the water. That's 339. We've been three minutes. On that, I'll stop. Now, what we're doing right now, I've told you, you take any motor from the Granger catalog and it kill these batteries. And I'm going to show you something. This is a motor from the Granger catalog. It's got Dayton, uh, which is their sign of motors they sell. This has got a gearbox on it. This chain, this rotates at 68 revolutions a minute to give the motor high torque. And so you're not drawing much power on this system. Yet if I try to hook it to these batteries that we have 127 volts, this motor runs off of 115 volts. It draws 2.2 amps, only 2.2 amps under load. We don't have a load. So you know it should be a lot less than 2.2 amps. It should be down around one amp or something that is drawing. But my point is, it will kill these batteries the instant I hook to it and this shaft of this motor won't even turn. Now there's something I want to tell you people about AC power. It's not AC power that runs a motor at any given fraction of a second. It has to be DC power in that momentary second because if you take a conductor, run current in the opposite direction with the same amount of voltage, it will cancel in any given second to get any kind of a magnetic field. The current has to be going in one direction only in that fraction of a second and then it changes and goes back the other way. But for that given second, it produces a magnetic field. So if you just touch it like this back and take it off, it should turn, and if you doubt it, just like if I take this motor right here, and I, you can see it turning. Watch how quick it'll stop when I unplug this. You can see how quick it stopped. Now watch if I just touch it. You see it move? Watch it move. I just touch it. I can't get that not to move. If I make a circuit, it's gonna, it's gonna move. As soon as you touch that, just a fraction of a second. Well, that's my point. You take DC power and put it in here, and it's got that little old tiny section about that wide that it brushes, it makes a contact or AC power for that given second. It's in one direction only, so you can touch this, and if you just touch it, it should run. Now, you know you're making a connection through the motor because the voltage will fall to zero on the battery pack. And to show you, what this voltage is, we will now hook it up. Now watch the voltage. You're going to see 127 volts. You see 127 volts? Okay. Now, I will still take this motor. We got 127 volts. take this wire right here I'm gonna make contact right there all right now I don't want to cancel anything you can see the voltage uh, what I'm gonna do put it on the voltage I'm gonna just hit this and watch the voltage go to zero you see it you yes. see, see zero? What you see? Right now, yes, it went to zero. All right. And it's back up again. Now, now watch the shaft now. Watch the shaft of the motor. And I'm going to make contact again, but it won't move. I make contact, it won't move. Look at the voltage on the, on the thing. Zero, seven point six. Okay, so it's, that's why it will not move. 
the motor draws way less than 2.2 amps when it's just taking off but it's throwing maximum current because let me show you something else look at the spark that you see here off that battery watch the spark over here you can see that fire yes that's showing maximum current now when you have current going into a motor but you have no voltage it's not going to run that's mighty funny I can take these same batteries and hook it to a seven and a half thousand pound machine I've built big Eureka that is built very closely with close tolerance and it runs like the Dickens it shocks everybody who sees it it's seven thousand percent efficient it'll change this world this motor here is demonstrating everything that you already seen on those videos the bigger I make this motor the same quote I made to my Pat attorney Emmett Pugh, the bigger I make it, the more power it produces and the less power it uses. Even a toy is a high drain device. I suppose that there are those who will say He had it easy, had it made in fact Before he'd even begun But they don't know the things I know I was always with him It may sound strange We were more than friends It's hard to tell the truth when no one wants to listen When no one really cares what's going on And it's hard to stand alone When you need someone beside you Your spirit, your faith must be strong What one man can do is dream what one man can do is love What one man can do is change the world and make it young again 
Here you see what one man can do As shaded as his eyes might be That's how bright his mind is That's how strong his love for you and me A friend to all the universe the Grandfather of the future Everything that I would like to be What one man can do is dream What one man can do is love What one man can do is change the world and make it new again Here you see what one man can do What one man can do is dream What one man can do is love What one man can do is the world and make it work again Here you see what one man can do that in May 1986, U.S. Representative Bob Livingston of Louisiana and Chairman of the Republican Study Committee wrote a five-page stinging report of the power brokers and their fight against Joseph Newman's fight for humanity? The report concluded, Joseph Newman has received arbitrary and unfair treatment at the hands of the PTO and Judge Jackson. Congress should act because the executive and judicial branches have failed this American citizen. In light of Congress's oversight responsibilities and the fact that it is empowered by the Constitution to issue patents, and the fact that the preponderance of evidence is in Newman's favor, and the fact that this invention is potentially beneficial to hundreds of millions of people, it is totally in order for Congress to grant Newman a patent and to allow the American marketplace to decide the value of this invention. On March 10, 1987, Congressman Robert W. Kastenmeier, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Court, Civil Liberties, and the Administration of Justice stated, This is the greatest conspiracy against any human being in the history of the world. 
concerning Joseph Newman's fight for humanity. All the numerous scientists on this film also scream to you, the people, as does the energy machine. It is done. Will you now finally help Joseph Newman to help you and all of humanity?